Hi everyone, welcome to another She Clicks webinar, again hosting on Zoom. I'm delighted today that we're going to be hearing from Kim Grant, who's going to talk to us about landscape photography. Kim is based in Scotland and she's been a Nikon user ever since she first started photography. Hi Kim, how are you? Hi, I'm really well Angela, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you very much. Now, um, we're relatively new to running uh, webinars like this on Zoom, but um, it's quite nice because it means people can interact a bit more easily and more directly. So as Kim talks, um, if you've got a question, just kind of make a mental note of it. And then at the end, there'll be an opportunity to actually ask that question directly of Kim. And you just need to, I think there's an icon you, you click on to raise your hand and then I can make it so you can actually um, speak and ask your question and then uh, Kim can answer it. Okay, so if you're ready, Kim, over to you. Thank you very much. So thank you everyone for coming along this morning to watch this little presentation that I've put on for you all. We're obviously going through very challenging times just now, so I hope you're all keeping well. Things are obviously beginning to change and especially here in the UK, different parts are beginning to open up and have different rules about getting out and about. Obviously doing landscape photography over this time hasn't been possible because we're not allowed to travel and really go out and about very often, but I hope as lockdown begins to unravel and we begin to get out and about again that this is something that I hope will help you all reconnect with nature moving forward in your photography journey. So today I'm going to sit down and talk to you all about the joys of landscape photography. So I do quite a lot of photography out and about in nature. The majority of my work is landscape photography but I also do wildlife photography and more recently have started doing macro photography as well. And I find these are all great ways to connect with nature and enjoy our time outdoors. Obviously today I'm here to talk to you about landscape specifically. So in this presentation I'm going to talk to you all about how landscape photography can help you to connect with the natural world, the sort of joys and wonders that getting out with your camera and photographing landscapes can really bring to you. I've then got a section on sort of techniques that I've sort of learned since beginning photography that can hopefully help you to improve or adapt your own image style. And what I think with landscape photography is, because you always want your images generally to be in focus, front to back focus and sharpness, your settings generally tend to be the same unless you're doing long exposure photography and changing your shutter speed. So when I'm doing presentations, I like to talk more about the creative aspect of landscape photography and how things such as your composition and ability to read the light can really help improve your images because I think that's what gives them the unique sides and can kind of take your photography to the next level. I'm also going to talk to you about different times of the day for doing landscape photography, changing the height and the perspectives that you shoot your images from and the art I guess of patience because obviously when you're out in nature it's very unpredictable, you don't know what's going to happen and you really have to be patient in order to get those images. So to begin, we're going to talk about this idea of connecting with a natural world, which, as I said, landscape photography is fantastic for. Now, photography in general is an incredibly powerful tool. It allows us to get creative. It gives us an artistic, you know, license and a genre, and it allows us to really connect with whatever subject matters interest us. And that's what's so great about photography, because you can literally photograph whatever your passions and interests are. And for me personally, I just love being out and about in nature with my camera. So landscape photography became a very powerful tool for me to help connect with the natural world, to photograph my journeys around my home country and photograph the different times of day and weathers that I was out with. The great thing as well with landscape photography is it really allows you to slow down and admire what's going on around you. And nowadays more than ever, I think our lives are becoming busier, with social media and the internet, we're always connected with people and things that are going on. But from time to time, we need to sort of get away from that, go out and about in nature and sort of disconnect from the hustle and bustle of life, but reconnect with nature. And landscape photography really helps us do that. It also allows us to step back and admire the weather changing. Now, obviously being out in nature, it can be very unpredictable at times. You don't know what's gonna happen. And that ability to step back from life and watch nature and the weather change can be very inspiring and a really good way for us in many ways to practice mindfulness. And watching also how the light interacts with the landscape. It's a really good way for us to see different parts of the landscape 
learn how to read the light, learn how to read weather fronts and all this together really allows us to appreciate and reconnect with nature and the natural world. So my photography journey really began because I spent a lot of time going out in the evenings and watching the sunset. Um, I was very fortunate to have been brought up in a very small fishing village, uh, obviously by the sea here in Scotland. And I used to go down to the beach every evening when I was a teenager and watch the sunset. And what was very prevalent to me or prominent to me was this idea that no two sunsets were the same. You know, some nights you would go out and there would be no interesting light. Some nights you would go out and you'd get these absolutely incredible colours in the sky. But the clouds were always different shapes. The way the light hit the clouds were always different. And the reflections on the sand were always different as well. And I just found this very captivating and it created loads of different moods and the atmosphere and the scene in front of me. And as I realised that this, it was so different and that every night, even though I was going to the same location, I was seeing something different. I wanted to begin to capture this and in order to sort of share the beauty that I was seeing and also just have like mementos really and in many ways connect with that landscape and really enjoy what was what was going on in front of me and I found it all in all a very therapeutic experience so that's where my love for landscapes began in many ways was watching the sunset and wanting to capture it and share it on, online through social media with other people. So in many ways staying connected with nature is very important as I sort of said a wee while ago you know we live very busy lives at the moment and to take that time out of our day or just for an hour a week to get out into nature is so good for us and in many ways landscape photography really helps us do this. The great thing I think about landscape photography especially is the unpredictable nature of it. Now you could say that all sort of genres of photography are very unpredictable but unlike when you're photographing indoors and you have control over the light and the conditions you know, if you're doing portraiture or photographing pets indoors, you know, you've got control over the artificial light and everything that you're using. When you're out doing landscape photography, you know, the weather depicts what light you're going to get. And that unpredictability can make it very exciting in many ways. And you often never know what images you're going to go home with, which I personally feel makes this genre of photography more exciting than any other, because it's a real challenge. And more times than not you will find that you will go home without an image that you're particularly happy with because potentially the conditions don't do what you want them to but not having that control really allows us in many ways to free ourselves and enjoy what is going on around us and to try and connect with it and I guess nature is such a powerful tool and be able to get out with your camera and photograph it in all of its moods and weathers it's just such a therapeutic experience that I think we can all enjoy and learn from. And as I sort of touched on already, it allows us to step back from our worries and truly immerse ourselves in the unpredictable. And to some people that might sound quite scary or fill them with anxiety, but actually going out and immersing yourself in the elements, it's so good for you in so many ways. And you just never know, like I say, what images, what images you're gonna go home with. And that makes it even more exciting. This is where my joy came from, this unpredictability of it all, but the excitement of that connection with nature. And um, yeah, like I say, more times than not, you're going to go home with an image that you're not particularly happy with. But when you do go out and you get those conditions that you were dreaming of, the buzz and the excitement that you can feel from getting those images when you get a stunning sunset or a stunning sunrise or you're greeted with a beautiful rainbow after a storm, it makes going out in those conditions and those elements really rewarding. And when you do get those cracking images that you're happy with, you know, that feeling that you get inside, it, nothing else can beat it in many ways. Another good thing I find about landscape photography is if, because you have to go outside and do it, potentially travel to different locations it allows you to see things that you otherwise wouldn't and quite often when I'm out with my camera even if I don't go home with an image that I'm not happy with I always see wildlife or patterns in nature or rainbows and unpredictable weathers that I wouldn't have seen if I hadn't gone out into nature and that connection and that ability to go out with your camera and try and connect with it is what makes landscape photography so exciting because it's an experience. It's not 
it's not just you know sitting back and, and maybe photographing the odd thing it's a whole experience and a whole adventure and that's what makes it so exciting and I guess it's one that you can never predict but it will always fulfill you because if you can go out there and try and get images and like I say maybe you won't come back with the images you're happy with you've still had that experience and you still feel fulfilled. So now that I've sort of told you how landscape photography is such a powerful tool to keep us connected with the natural world, I'm now going to talk you through sort of five tips that I've learned in the 11 years that I've been doing landscape photography that will hopefully help you to create good landscape images moving forward in your own photographic journeys. So these different and things are, I'm going to first go over composition, then the ability to read the light, the time of day, height you're taking your images from, and patience. So beginning with composition. Now in many ways composition can completely make or break an image. You'll find when a lot of people get into landscape photography that people tend to take snapshots. So what I mean by snapshots are often images that you would maybe take if you were on holiday, for instance, just sort of snapping away for memories. But you very soon learn that the composition of your image and how you compose a landscape around you is what can really make your image pop. And it's looking at different factors within the landscape that you can put into your image, but equally take out of your image to ensure that interesting composition. Now, one of the great ways to do this is to find something in the landscape that you can focus the viewer's attention on. And this is normally a certain subject matter that takes your interest, whether it would be a rock, a rock pool, a mountain, the sky, but there has to be something within your image that's a focal point and that really draws people in. You know, you're wanting to create an image that's appealing to the eye. And especially when you're out and about in nature, you want to showcase that landscape in front of you to the best of your ability and to make it as beautiful to whoever views your image later as you feel it to be when you're out in the fields. And you also want to create a 3D effect within your, your photographs. And I'll sort of show you how to do that shortly. And as I say, you want to really show off the true beauty of your scene. The first way you can do this by changing your composition is to find a foreground, middle ground and background within your image. Now I've got a few images here to sort of show you how you can achieve this effect. So this is a lighthouse taken quite near my house and here you can see in the foreground you've got some interesting foreboding rocks with interesting patterns which acts as the foreground. In the middle ground you've got the sea and then in the background you've got more rocks with the lighthouse and also the, the sky. And here I've shot this image in what people refer to as the rule of thirds, which I'm sure many of you have heard that um, phrase many a time. And it's a great visually appealing way to create a good visually appealing image. And when you're shooting landscapes especially, finding that foreground, middle ground and background and shooting it in the rule of thirds is a great way to create that 3D effect. So what you can see here is there's not much negative space in this image. Having the rocks in the foreground gives you a sort of anchor point, which then leads the viewer's eye into the focal point, which is the lighthouse. And it has that layered effect, giving you that foreground, middle ground and background. This is another image here. This is, a, again, a castle quite near my house. And again here you've got the, the grass and the rocks in the foreground with the sea in the middle ground and the castle and the, the sky in the background. And again you can kind of see here that there's that layered effect and you've got that 3D effect because you've got things in each section of your image. You know, what you'll sometimes find is that people will photograph an, an image and they'll have a lot of grass or a lot of sky and if the sky is fantastic and beautiful and has loads of colours in it, it can be very visually appealing but generally speaking you want to try and balance your image with different subject matters that will give you that 3D effect and get rid of a lot of negative space within your images. The second way you can do this to create better visually appealing compositions is by finding balance with a specific focal point. Now what I mean by this is finding something that you can centre in your photographs which really adds a focus to your image. 
Now, if you have a focal point in, say, the left-hand side of your frame, but there's nothing in the right-hand side, it creates a very unbalanced image. If you have something in the right and the left-hand side that complements each other, then the image is balanced. But an easy way to do this is to find something that you can centre in your frame where the majority of the interest is, which allows you that balance and allows you that focal point. So here we've got the Kalanash standing stones on the Isle of Lewis and the very focal point of this image is the, the big stone in the centre with the rainbow out of the side of it, which adds that focal point within the image where the viewer's eye is instantly attracted to. But the other good thing about this image, which was completely un unintentional and I never realised this until I got home, is you'll see that on the left hand side of the image the stones are much bigger than the stones on the right hand side of the image but in the flip side to that you'll see that the clouds are more prominent and there's more clouds on the right hand side of the image and less clouds on the left hand side of the image so because you've got big rocks on the bottom left and a lot of clouds on the top right that balances each other out and then on the flip to that, you've got smaller stones on the right and less clouds on the left, which just adds a really balanced image because there's as much going on on the left-hand side of the image as the right-hand side, but you've got that focal point. Now, this image was very lucky. You know, it's not every day you go out and you are greeted with a rainbow that happens to be slap bang in the middle of your image or where you have these clouds and a foreground interest that you can balance in this way. But this is just a good image to show you what I mean by this idea of a focal point and this idea of balance. So it's something that you can look out for when you're out in your own photography adventures. Now this image is a very simplistic image. It's sort of depicting the idea of peace and serenity and sort of isolation of being by the coast. But again, you can see here, I have pictured this beach hut bang in the center of the image because there's not really anything at each side of the image, at each, at each side of the beach hut, sorry. You've got a very, what is on the left-hand side is also on the right-hand side. Even with the clumps of grass in front of the beach hut, you know, you've got a very similar shaped size of clump of grass on the left as you do on the right. And the sky is also pretty reasonably balanced here as well. So you can see in this image, it works well in terms of having a focal point and that balance, because you've got something big and obvious in the center, but you've got exactly the same on the left-hand side as the right-hand side, which adds that balance and that overall focus in on the image. And again, it can be hard to find something like this when you're out in the field, you know, there's often landscapes change and, you know, there's, there's, there's mounds that go up and down and clouds are different shapes. But again, this is something to look out for if you are in a location that's quite remote and in many ways quite barren. If you can find at that focal point and have the same landscape on the left hand side as the right hand side, you'll have that focus and something interesting to focus your eye into. The next way you can improve your composition is through the use of leading lines. Now I've got a few examples of what I mean by leading lines because there's so many different ways that you can find leading lines within landscapes and that's why they work so well. So here on the left hand side we've got an historic pier at a harbour which adds as a natural leading line even though it's man-made it's that sort of natural leading line within the photograph leading the viewer's eye into the image. And although it's not strictly landscape photography, I've also included my feet in this image to show a human interacting with the landscape. And the fact that my feet are pointing to the pier, it also adds that leading line from me interacting with the grass through the pier, which then takes the viewer's eye right into the scene. What would have made this image better would have been if the sky had been nicer and I would have been naturally leading the viewer's eye into something beautiful. But on the whole, you can see that using leading lines here leads the viewer's eye through the whole picture. So there's very little in the picture that again is deemed as negative space. So you've got that transition and that movement through your photograph, which gives you that 3D effect and that natural, it allows the, the eye to naturally just look through the whole image. This one on the right is showing you how you can kind of get creative with using one second exposures. And a great way to do this is if you're photographing waves coming into shore. 
if you've got rocks or stones on, on the beach, you can get those really interesting lines going back out into the sea as the waves retreat. And this is a really good creative way to create leading lines or patterns within your images, which again just allows the landscape and nature within your image to flow through your whole image and just create something that little bit different and a little bit more unique. If this is something that you know you find visually appealing, it's a, it's a good way to do that. Another natural way in many ways to, to find leading lines is if you live near a river or a stream and you've got nice little rapids or you know like a bubbling brook and you've got these nice patterns within the, the river, doing a bit of long exposure you can show off the movement of the water and create these, these white lines through your image which again can lead the viewer's eye into the image and through the whole image as a whole. If you're photographing waterfalls for instance you may have the waterfall and then some nice white lines or patterns coming out into, into the, the river or the stream and again doing a bit of long exposure it can allow you to show off those patterns and shapes as the water moves and create those leading lines that will lead the viewer's eye through your whole image. And this one on the right was taken at the famous Quran on the Isle of Skye. And it's not the most obvious leading line, but behind the tree and before the famous mound in the landscape, you've got this almost ridge shape, which is quite a natural leading line that leads the viewer's eye from the tree into the ridge at the back of the image which shows that leading lines don't always have to be very obvious and prominent in your image. You can get a little bit more creative and find leading lines in other aspects of the image, just to again allow the viewer's eye to, be, to move through the image naturally and show off the full scale of the landscape that you're photographing. Another way to improve your composition is through the use of reflections. So generally in landscape photography, I teach people not to put their horizon in the centre of the frame because nine times out of ten it doesn't work. But the only time that I always would say to people that it's a good idea is when you're shooting reflections, especially if you're somewhere like a river, you know, a water location, whether it's a sea, a river, a beach, a stream. You know, if you've got that really crisp, clear, calm water and you're greeted with a beautiful sunrise or sunset or even beautiful clouds during the day, having that your horizon in the centre of the frame allows you to reflect what's going on in the sky completely against what is going on, on reflecting on the water in front of you. And it allows for that very balanced, mirrored effect. So this doesn't often work when you're shooting landscapes in general because you'll end up with a lot of negative space. But if you have got a really interesting sky and really interesting reflections, like I say, it allows for that mirrored effect and that balance. But one thing I also always say when you're photographing reflections is not to have just the reflections. So in this image, you'll see there's some little sticks sticking out of the, the water here. And what that does is it adds a little bit of focus into the image. So if they weren't in this picture, it would be a very flat picture. It would still in many ways be beautiful because you'd have those nice reflections and colors, but you want some sort of focus for the viewer's eye to focus in on. And although this is quite a subtle thing, you know, these little sticks in the water, it is something that adds that depth to the image and allows the viewer's eye to, to go into it and gives it a little bit more of a 3D effect and gets us away from that flat images. It's another example here of a reflection shot. It's not so obvious here that the horizon is bang in the centre of the frame because the horizon has got the mist coming off the, the loch here, sort of going over the, the horizon. And also because the boat in the foreground is very prominent in this image, it's not so clear that the horizon's bang in the centre until you properly look at it. But again, with this being a reflection shot, I found it quite nice to have the, the horizon bang in the centre, especially in terms of the very subtle trees that you have on the left hand side of the image, being able to balance them and mirror them against the, the loch here, I found worked really well. But again, if I'd photographed this image without the boat, it would have been very flat, in many ways very boring. But having that boat in the foreground and giving it something for the viewer to really focus their attention on 
allows you to create more of a 3D and more interesting image. So while reflections can look stunning to the naked eye, when you're photographing them, just make sure you have something else in your frame than just the reflection itself, and it will really allow your image to pop. So we next move on to the ability to read the light. Now, in landscape photography, actually, in fact, in every style of the photography, light is so important because you need light in order to illuminate your subject matter. And as mentioned before, in landscape photography, generally speaking, you have no control over the light. I mean, even if you plan your shoots and ensure that you go out when there's certain weather conditions, as we all know, the weather can change so quickly and the weather forecast isn't always right. So learning how to take photographs in different weather conditions will help make your landscape photography better in many ways. And what I mean by this is I believe you can get good images at all times of the day, but you have to adapt to what you're photographing to try and get those interesting images. So different light, lights and different weathers require different approaches when you're out doing landscape photography. Also being able to read the light is something that I found can take quite a long time because you have to find when you're going out into nature, you really have to delve into the landscape and spend a lot of time watching how the clouds move across the sky and how that movement of clouds um, results in pockets of light coming out and focusing or, or going on to different parts of the land and illuminating different parts of the landscape. And I actually find that when I'm out just for general walks or cycles or just out and about in general, I tend to spend a lot of time just watching the sky and watching the weather and how different conditions and different lights go on to the landscape in different ways. Because in many ways, this is it just shows you that the light can totally transform a scene. And if you can spend the time reading the light and watching how the weather and the light interact with the landscape when you're not out with your camera, when you do go out with your camera, you'll have a much better understanding of what you're looking for or what the weather conditions you're greeted with, how they are potentially going to, to cause light to hit the landscape. Because at the end of the day, different weathers will create different moods. And as I said before, in photography, light is everything. So here's a few examples of images that I've taken that sort of shows you how different lights or can change the landscape and how this idea that light is everything. So both of these images were actually shot around midday, which is normally seen as not the most optimum time for landscape photography because everybody wants to go out at the golden hours of sunrise and sunset. But you can see by these images that by being out during the day and being out in conditions that are maybe quite stormy or different to your average day, you can still get good images at midday. You don't always have to go out at golden hours. So this one on the left was taken obviously on a coastal beach here and it was during really stormy conditions. So it was very windy. There was a lot of snow showers going on this day, which has obviously created these really dark foreboding skies in the background. And I didn't expect the sun to come out at all this day, but out of nowhere, the clouds parted and I got this intense light that only lasted about two minutes, but it completely illuminated the landscape around me, created these beautiful highlights on the dunes and created this very obvious contrast in the image, which really illuminated the colors of these beach huts and also created these very striking shadows on the beach. So I always show this image to show this idea that if I'd shot this image two minutes previous, it was very dark, very grey, it would have been a very boring and flat image. But having that intense light just come through the clouds and cause this highlights and shadows here just completely transformed this image and shows you how light can really, you know, benefit your images and just change them into something a little bit more exciting. Now, sadly, I've lost the original file for this one on, on the, the right, which is a shame because I, I love this image. So I've got quite a pixelated photograph here with an old watermark on it. But again, this image was taken during the day and this was down in a forest area in Perthshire here in Scotland. Now, I've been back to this area a few years since this has happened. A few times I've been back here to try and photograph this photograph again. And the thing is Perthshire gets 
has a lot of trees and in the autumn it's a stunning location to do photography but also you'll find down there in the autumn generally speaking it's very wet very overcast and getting a good image of these beautiful colors can be quite difficult but one day the first time i was ever down there again the light just came through the clouds and caused this beautiful sun on the trees which allowed the colors of the forest and this bridge to really pop and come alive and again it shows you have to kind of be out there waiting for the light to change and sometimes if you're lucky you will be you know you will get the conditions that you want but um, yeah, it's just showing you again that you don't always have to be out at optimum times of the day. If you get the weather, and especially when the light comes through the clouds during windy, rainy days, it can really allow, allow for some interesting colour within your images. Now, I'm not into black and white photography really at all because I like to show colour in my images. But sometimes you'll be out and it will be a very overcast day or it will be very moody and dull and just not very good in terms of finding nice colors and light. But one thing you can do in these conditions, if it interests you, is convert your images to black and white or shoot in black and white from the off. But one thing I like to do is shoot all my images in color. And if I go home and the images aren't looking too good, but it was a moody atmospheric day, I have the option to convert them to black and white. And although I'm not particularly happy with this image, I love the fact that we have these interesting and very striking cliff faces at the bottom of the image and I loved how this beam of light just came through the clouds and began to reflect and show some contrast on the waves that were coming into shore. It shows I guess atmosphere and mood and again something I like to say to people is just because it's an overcast dull day it doesn't mean you shouldn't go out and try and get images because you never know what the weather's going to do and especially if you're in a part of the country where the weather can change very quickly you do get these beautiful beams of light coming through the clouds which can illuminate parts of the landscape and really make them pop and converting your image to black and white can allow you to make something out of quite a dull boring shoot that you maybe didn't think you were gonna gonna get so don't always feel disheartened when you come home and your images aren't what you hope they would be. You know, consider converting them to black and white and see if you can bring new life into your photographs. So we're now going to look at the time of day for photography. So there's many times a day that you can go out and do landscapes. And obviously the majority of people tend to go out at the golden hours or pre-sunrise and post-sunset. But twilight during the day and night time can also be great times of the day to do photography. I'm just going to give you some examples of images I've taken at all these different times of the day and how I've adapted to those times of the day to create interesting images and how each time of the day you can have a different approach to your landscape photography. So I'm going to start with the golden hour just because it's the most well-known time of the day for landscape photographers to go out. Um, a lot of landscape photographers will only ever go out around sunrise and sunset because that is when you have the highest chance of getting beautiful light and it's when the light changes and it cannot be its most subtle but also it's most intense and when you're potentially going to get these beautiful colours. It allows you in many, if you get that golden light, you can get some really interesting contrast and shadows within your landscape which can create that 3D effect and really make your images pop. And golden hours can be fantastic times of day because they really bring the landscape to life. You sometimes find that you'll see things in the landscape that you wouldn't normally see because they are illuminated with this beautiful light that, you know, during the day or when it's dull weather, you don't always see this. And it can bring a new lease of life in many ways to whatever scene that you're photographing. This is an image that I took many years ago now, and although it's not completely in focus, this is one of the, my favourite images I've ever taken because this was a night which was very overcast. As you can see, there's a lot of clouds in the, the sky, but literally out of nowhere, just before the sun went before, be, below the horizon, we were greeted with this very intense beam of light and this very intense colour and golden light over the landscape. And on the right hand side of the image, you'll see that there's a rock here. And I never realized until I got home, but if you look closely on the left hand side of this rock, there's almost like a face. There's quite an obvious eye, nose and mouth. And a few people that have looked at this image have said that they can see two faces in it. I can only see one, but it's a good way to sort of make your imagination run wild. 
But the point that I sort of show with this is that during golden hours, you can see things in the landscape that you, as I say, would maybe not normally notice. And because I was rushing to get this image because the light was so fleeting, I never noticed this shape on the night. But when I went home and edited my image, it gave the image a new lease of life to me and it showed something interesting within the landscape or the scene that I otherwise wouldn't have, have seen, you know, when I was out there. And this is another sort of image showing you this idea of golden light. So, you know, sometimes when you're shooting at sunrise or sunset, the light can be incredibly intense, which can sometimes make it quite difficult to shoot. But again, it just completely brings that landscape to life and allows you to see colours and shapes within the landscape that you maybe otherwise wouldn't. And just having that colour in your image, I think, can really help to create a sort of positive message and beauty within your images and scene. And just being out during sunrise or sunset can be you know, very awe-inspiring and it's just a lovely time of day to, to be out. So we then look at the sort of pre-sunrise and post-sunset. So this is when you're most likely to get those beautiful colours in the clouds, which create those beautiful reflections on water. Um, it also can be a really nice time of day to see subtle blues and purples in the opposite direction to the sunset. So I find if I'm out photographing the sunset or I'm out before sunrise and it's not going to be the most beautiful sunrise or sunset, if you turn round and look to the opposite side that the sun is setting or rising, you will often see these beautiful blues and purples, especially if it's cloudy in the sky. And sometimes turning around and shooting these, you can get really, like I say, subtle light. This light that you don't need any filters to, to enjoy and it can really add something a little bit different. I also find at these times of day, they're often some of my favourite times to shoot because your senses in many ways are heightened because it's still quite dark. So the rest of your senses are very heightened. You can hear things, see things, smell things that you maybe normally wouldn't. And it's just, and overall, it's just a very nice time of day to shoot. And if you're not somebody that likes using filters, for instance, especially if it's quite overcast and cloudy, you can get really even light pre-sunrise or post-sunset, which can just add so much beauty to the landscape. So this is the idea I was sort of depicting here about these, you know, really colourful clouds that you can get at these times of day, which can create these beautiful reflections. So, you know, getting up really early before the sunrise or staying out after the sunset it can really reap benefits for you and you'll find that a lot of people will go out for the exact sunrise or the exact sunset but i always say to people get to a location an hour before sunrise and stay an hour after sunset because they're when you're most likely to get these beautiful colors and see things and just enjoy the landscape either waking up for another day or slowing down and going to sleep at the end of the day and like I say it's often when you're likely to get these these more vibrant colors so be patient get up early stay out late and you're more likely to be rewarded so twilight is actually as well as what I've just discussed it's actually one of my favorite times of day to shoot I love the beautiful blue tones that you get around twilight it's also great for long exposures. I mean, I do quite a lot of long exposures during sunset and also during the day. But if you're shooting at twilight, you often don't need filters because it's so dark already that you create natural long exposures within your images. Twilight's also a very good time of day to create moody images and atmosphere. And you'll find at twilight that the brightest stars in the sky are visible. So you're sort of in that zone, obviously, between day and night. And that blue light can be so magical and mystical, especially if you've got beautiful mountains on the horizon in your images. It can just be a lovely time to be out. And if the moon is out at this time of day, you've got that lovely light on the, on the, being cast on the landscape as well, which can just be a beautiful time of day to be out. This image here was taken um, many years ago at a, a, a loch here in Scotland and this was taken just before the sort of pre-sunrise hour and we had this beautiful blue tones here both in the sky and being reflected on, on the loch here and this loch if I'm honest isn't very beautiful during the day it's quite bland and there's not much going on but getting up early and seeing it at blue hour it showed me parts of it that I didn't really notice during the day. You know, these sort of 
contrasts and the, the silhouettes of the, the trees on the horizon and just the beautiful sort of reflections in that here. And this jetty is not the most picturesque, but just having it there as a focal point leading into the loch, you know, the atmosphere that you can find when you get out at twilight, it can just be so beautiful. And that natural blues can also just create nice tones and natural colour within your images. And again, this is another image shot at twilight. This was taken up a, in the Cairngorms. Um, this one, the last one was taken before sunrise, this one was taken before sunset. And it's just a lovely time of day to be out, you know, having the blue on the, the mountains in the background and reflecting it onto the loch. It's just such a lovely way, I think, to end the day, to be out in that twilight hour. And as I was mentioning at the start of this presentation, when you're out doing landscape photography, it's not all about the photos, it's about the experience of being out in nature. And on this particular night, I could begin to hear tawny owls calling around the loch and, you know, wildlife that you don't really see during the day beginning to, to appear and make, make noises, which just allows your senses in many ways to run wild and allows you to just connect with nature in a new and exciting way. So daytime is the most challenging time of day for landscape photography, and it's a time of day that a lot of photographers don't even attempt landscape photography because the light can be very harsh. If it's sunny, you can get very bright highlights and dark shadows. It's very easy to overexpose your images during the daytime. And often if it's on the contrast to that, if it's a dull, flat light, sort of boring day, it can be very difficult to get images of, you know, that are gonna be interesting. But if you are greeted with stormy conditions, if it's windy, wild, you've got weather fronts coming and going, and you've got rainbows, daytime is still a really good time of day to go out with your camera because you never know what you might find within the landscape. And that can often make it a much bigger challenge than the more stereotypical times of day to do photography. But when you are rewarded, it really is worth it. So this is an image I took one afternoon not that long ago and this sort of depicts the idea of how sort of stormy weather can completely transform your images so this wasn't a complete storm coming in but it had just been very sunny then this cloud came in it had, it had about a 10 minute shower of rain then the sun came out again but just being out on the beach during that 10 minutes when it was raining I was able to capture this very dark foreboding cloud and the interesting shapes within it. And in some ways it was swirling around in the sky, which was very difficult to capture, but it shows that you can still get interesting images during the day. If, if you're out during those changes in weather, that can be very moody and atmospheric in many ways. And this image here was also taken about midday. This is on my way to the Isle of Skye. And here you can see on the left, we had beautiful sunny weather. And on the right, again, you've got this weather front coming in. And that change of weather can create some nice intense light, interesting lights, contrast and colour within your images. So although you've not got that beautiful colours that you'd get in the golden hour, you can still find that light and that contrast within your images if you're getting those weather changes. And up here in Scotland, the weather changes very quickly. You know, we can have four seasons in one day. And I guess that's what makes Scotland in many ways so appealing to landscape photographers because you can go out at all times of day, especially from like autumn to early spring. You know, you can be out at all times of day shooting and you get these changes in weather so frequently and quickly that can cause these interesting lights and contrast in the landscape. And nighttime's the final time of day that I'm quickly going to go over. Now, obviously, this is going more into astrophotography, but I also think it's a good time to get out and just enjoy the landscape in some ways because, you know, you can get creative with your photography here. You can illuminate the landscape with artificial light. But also, if you're really lucky, it's a good time of day to potentially see the northern lights. Um, we're going through a period just now where the northern lights aren't very active, but in about four or five years time, they're predicting that we're going to get a lot more shows again. So it's a great time to get out and use the landscape around you to create interesting foreground to have the northern lights in the background. If you're into photographing stars, you can use the landscape to create silhouettes within your image. Again, if the moon's out, you can get that lovely natural light going through your image, which can just be beautiful. And it allows you to feel and see the landscape at basically all times of the day. 
And I actually find if you can adapt to different times of the day and get out and shoot at night time as well as the daytime, it allows you in many ways to appreciate the landscape more and feel it in all of its moods and weathers, which can really, I think, improve your photography because you understand the landscape and the weather that little bit more. And it's just a few images here just, you know, showing, you know, the northern lights. This is something that you're obviously not going to see during the day. Um, we we're very fortunate in the part of Scotland I live about five years ago, we were having northern lights displays almost every week, you know, when we we're going through a really big peak of solar activity. And it was just incredible to get out and enjoy that time of day and see this coastline and this landscape that I shot so much, you know, during the daytime illuminated in a completely different way at night time. And it taught me patience and also allowed me to see in a different light, which was really exciting. And this was as in our photo just to depict again, it's not really landscape, it's more astral, but this was a very bright night. The moon was out, which is why the sky is nice and blue. But it just shows, you know, if you go out for a nice walk, you know, in the landscape and, and out in nature at night with your camera, it's amazing what you can see. And again, you can feel those landscapes and locations that you enjoy so much in a different way, in a different light, which can, um, on the whole, improve your photography in the long run. Um, changing the height you shoot your images at is something that I think is quite important in landscape photography because we all see the world from eye level. So you'll find a lot of people like to take photographs from eye level and the majority of the time there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're wanting to create something that little bit more unique and unusual, I find that getting down low or up high, you know, climbing up a hill or something like that, to find a new vantage point of a landscape will allow you to create far more unique images. One way I do this is I actually shoot the majority of my landscape photographs with my tripod down really low to the ground because I'm seeing a different perspective of a landscape that we don't see when we're naturally walking around. And especially if I was doing the sort of foreground, middle ground and background that I was referring to earlier, getting low to the ground will allow me to include a rock or something within my image that I wouldn't be able to include if I was shooting it from eye level, which adds that depth within the image. Also changing the height of your tripod or where you're shooting from can completely change the story behind your image. And I've got a little example of that to show you in a second. And also changing the height you're shooting at can help you to remove distract, distracting objects from your image. So when it comes to landscape photography, I often find that what you take out of your image can sometimes be more important than what you put in it. Because generally speaking, you're wanting quite a clear image that's not chaotic. And one thing that a lot of people do is they try, they see this beautiful scene in front of them and they want to capture the whole thing. And if it's quite a, a I don't know if it's quite a obvious sort of scene and there's not too much in the foreground that can work really well but sometimes when you try and capture the whole scene there's a lot going on and there's it really makes the image quite distracting so by changing what height you're shooting at you can eliminate certain things from your photographs which can then make your image a little bit more simple to look at but also make it more striking and unique. So this is just a little example I've got here of how changing the height of your tripod can tell a different story within your image. So I actually shot this example for a YouTube video I created to show how changing the height you're shooting at can change the perspective and change the story behind your image. So the one on the left is showcasing more of the landscape that is around this lighthouse. You know, you're seeing the beautiful mountains in the backgrounds. You've got the leading line of the walls leading into the, land, into the lighthouse itself. But you have got the mountains of the image that you don't have in the right hand side. So what that image is doing is it's telling a story of this wild remote location that this, this lighthouse is in but it doesn't really show off the scale of the lighthouse. So the one on the right, because it's shot really low to the ground, although in some ways it's a shame because we're not seeing the, the mountains behind it, it is showing off how tall and big this lighthouse is. And I did take a few photographs also of me standing at the bottom of it, which added more scale. But it's just showing that when you're out photographing, 
you know, photographing at eye level can be really good. And if you're wanting to show off the scene in this particular situation, it works well. But if you want to show off how big and bold and striking this lighthouse is and how towering and tall it is, getting low to the ground changes that perspective and changes the story behind the image as a whole, which can create a more unique image. But it depends what you're wanting to photograph and what story you want to tell with your images. I think it's always good to think of a story or how the landscape is making you feel. And one of the things I love about lighthouses is how tall they are and how striking they are. So I like to show the scale of it, but I also like to show the location they're in. So by taking both photographs, I've told both those stories, but in a slightly different way. And I took both these images from exactly the same position, like the same spot. The only thing I changed was the height that I shot them at. So the final thing to sort of help with your photography is the idea of patience. Now, people, a lot of people find patience very difficult. Um, when I began photography, I wasn't a particularly patient person. You know, I'd go out and be quite disheartened if I went home with images I wasn't happy with. But, you know, I've learned over the years that you have to have that patience and that drive, I guess, to go out and try time and time again. And as I mentioned earlier, that buzz that you get when you get a good image is outweighs, you know, all the times you go out and you're disappointed. You know, it's like anything in life. You have to put the hours in in order to see the results. And especially in something like landscape photography, because you have no control over the weather and the conditions, you have to have that patience to try time and time again to go home with images that you're going to be in many ways happy with. Also, patience, I find, leads you to be better at reading the light because if you're patient and take the time from time to time to step back from your camera and just admire the elements and the scenes around you it can then help you to connect with it more and put that connection and that patience back into your photography. Um, this is very similar to the image I showed you earlier but this afternoon I very nearly went home after the sunset because I just didn't think anything was going to come of the sunset but I thought, you know what, I'll stick it out. And I did stick it out. And I was really glad that I did because if I had started driving home and the sky had lit up like this, I would have been in many ways devastated that I'd left the location earlier um, than I'd maybe anticipated to. So I show this image to show that being patient and you know putting the hours in and staying out and just seeing what the conditions are gonna do is often when you're gonna be rewarded. You know, obviously there are going to be times when you go out and you are rushing, you haven't got that time and you will be lucky, but you will find that the time, the times that you go out and dedicate, you know, proper time to your photography and, you know, sit around and are just patient and watch the light. It's often those times where you're going to go away potentially with the better photographs because you're not rushing and you're ready for things to change but also where you can immerse yourself in nature as a whole. And although the sunset that this afternoon was what interested me the most, you know, just watching the swans and the wildlife going past me, it was all in all that idea I was talking about earlier of an experience as a whole. You know, you want photography to be enjoyable, so you want it to be relaxing. And, you know, taking that time to enjoy it, watch the weather change and just watch the whole of nature around you um, can really help you get that therapeutic side out of being out with your camera. Again, this is an idea of patience. Um, I've been to this location three times when I was down photographing it. And um, yeah, it just shows that on the third day I went, I was sort of greeted with the nice reflections and calm conditions that I was after. The two mornings I'd been previously, it was very cloudy and overcast and just not very good for photography or not the conditions that I wanted for this location so it just shows again being patient returning time and time again eventually your results um you know you will be rewarded so remember that landscape photography is an experience as a whole it's about getting out there and embracing the unpredictability of nature you never know what's going to happen when you're out there you don't know what you're going to see what you're going to experience but that's what's so exciting about it in many ways you won't always go home with images you're happy with, but I can guarantee that you will always see and experience things that you otherwise wouldn't, which makes it a really exciting and rewarding experience. So yeah, use your photography to connect with nature and embrace the unpredictability of the weather and the landscape. 
and the process will open your mind and bring a new meaning to your life. And in many ways, I can guarantee that. We all need time in nature. We all need time in the landscape. And, you know, taking the time to find that and to just enjoy the experience as a whole is something that I'm sure you'll all really enjoy. So, yeah, thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Kim. Would you... Uh, there you go. You're in the process of it. <laughs> just so we can see you. So um, we've got some questions coming in. If anyone would like to ask a question, please raise your hand or put it in the Q&A. Um, I can make it possible so you can speak or I can read your question from the Q&A. Um, one observation or a couple of observations about uh, your images mm -hmm. um, and your talk. When you were, I'll, tell you what, I'll just switch to gallery view and then we can see both of us. There we are. When you showed an image of um, reflections and you were saying about in including the sticks, Mm -hmm. in the image and you know to help give depth and scale and stuff I also thought actually that kind of helped me make sense of the image as well so I could see you know immediately oh right that's a reflection and this is something in the foreground and then you kind of piece it together and it helped me enjoy the image which I thought was quite interesting yeah yeah definitely I mean like I said a lot of people when they shoot reflections they're so taken like in awe with the reflection itself especially if you've got that beautiful light and that beautiful clouds you know, you do photograph it because you want to, but if you haven't got something else in that image that either tells a story of where you are or the history of the place you are or just something to add a focus in, the image can just look quite flat and you also don't really get a sense of where you are. You know, I, like I, I sort of touched on this idea of telling a story with your image. So although you could say the story is the beautiful sunset and the beautiful reflections, you do need that something extra. I mean, it could have just been a rock or it could have been, could have been anything, you know, being on the beach or even just patterns in the sands. But you need something as well as just that reflection um, to, to sort of add that, that, I don't know, meaning to the photograph. Yeah. Um, and also, I thought it was interesting when you were talking about going out and looking at the light when you haven't got your camera, mm -hmm. because um, I mean, I, I, don't, I test cameras for a living and, you know, I've been doing it for a long time and I'm always looking for the right conditions to go out with the camera I want to shoot. And you, if you've got to, you know, test cameras in a certain time frame, you can't always get the best light. So consequently, if I ever went out without a camera and it was really good light, I used to get really stressed about it. And it's taken me quite a long time to kind of calm down and not worry about it and do exactly what you say is kind of just look at things and, think, and make mental notes thinking this will be a good place to come back or actually if the sun was a bit lower or maybe later in the year when it's over there so you know I think that's a very interesting point to just try and treat it almost as a reconnaissance mm -hmm. exercise yeah I mean the thing is we all go out well you know most people go out for walks whether it's on their own with their family go out for cycles runs even if you're out working and you're traveling back and forth to work in your car you know I remember when I started photography I used to get so disheartened if I was working and there was a beautiful sunrise or sunset and I got to work or I was driving but I sort of I began to appreciate that and think yes I'm busy just now I can't be out with my camera but I can see what the clouds are doing and how the lights interact with the land so that when I have a day free and I can go out with my camera, I'll maybe understand things a little bit better. And also, I always often find that I didn't want that pressure of every time I was out for a walk or out and about that I had to take my camera with me. So sort of stepping back from that and just immersing myself in nature and enjoying the light when I'm out doing other things, you can then bring that experience that you've learned back into your photography so that you can kind of learn from it and in some ways it takes that pressure away as well and helps you appreciate things a little bit more I think. I think so. Uh, right so just to go on to some of the questions so Francesca asked she would like to know what software do you use to edit your images and what do you use specifically to convert to black and white? So I use Lightroom to edit all my images Um, I've never used Photoshop or anything like that there was a time when I tried Luminar and I quite enjoyed it, but I tend to, because I do blogging and stuff as well, I tend to have the whole Adobe package because of the, it's just cheaper for me in the long run. But I've always used Lightroom. It took me quite a few years to get used to it, but now that I sort of know the sliders, I'm, I'm quite happy with it. And I tend to do quite a lot of 
my editing is quite basic because I quite like to get the images right in camera but because I shoot in raw I do need to you know adjust a few things to allow the contrast and saturation to come out and yeah on Lightroom there is a, a small button you click that will nah, just convert it to black and white so I can do everything on there which is mm -hmm. quite easy so yeah. Yeah and then you just adjust the, the coloured sliders to get the, the look that you want. Great. Uh, Mira has asked Oh, how much, well, you've kind of answered it actually, how much post-processing do you do to your photographs? Yes, yeah, so as I said, I do very minimal in many ways. I just adjust the contrast, the highlights a little bit and the saturation. I do sometimes mess around with the clarity and sharpness as well. I mean, there will be times when I'm out and I'm not satisfied with my images and I will do more editing um, if I feel I have to. You know, sometimes some images require more editing than others, but where possible, I try and minimise that editing. So. Yeah, the majority of the time quite basic. You know, I'm not somebody that takes things out of images and adds things in or does things like that. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's quite quite basic editing. I can probably edit a photo in a few minutes if it's a simple edit or take a bit longer if it's more complicated. So you don't tend to collect skies to put into other images or anything like that? No, I've never done anything like that. I just, I think for me, photography is about connecting with nature and what happens when I'm out there. So I want Whatever the sky's like when I'm out, it's what it was like. So I like to sort of show what it was like and the beauty of what I experienced. So when I look back at my photographs, I can be like, oh, yeah, I remember that day. That was beautiful. Mm -hmm. or, or it might not have been beautiful, but I learned something from it. So, yeah. yeah, I don't take things out and add things into my images. Now, I know you said you're not especially into black and white photography, but if you go out and it's a stormy day or stormy sky, do you always shoot in colour or do you sometimes switch to black and white to help you visualise? And obviously you've still got the raw file. I always shoot in colour. Um, mm -hmm. I've never shot in black and white. I think it's just because for me, colour is so important. I don't know why, but I mean, I do like occasionally doing um, long expo exposure black and white images on like dull days, but mm -hmm. I prefer to always have that coloured file and then convert it on the computer if I feel, I have, if I feel it would work better. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Anne has said that she was interested in your view of negative space and perspective when shooting reflections. So thank you for that. Yeah, so I know I've mentioned a few times this idea of have, not having negative space in your landscape photographs, but I think it depends what you're photographing. Like there is times when I will be doing long exposure landscape photography and I will have something very simplistic like a rock in water or a stick sticking out of water and the rest of the landscape will be very negative. But I would only personally ever do that if I was shooting when it was misty or when I was doing long exposure photography. And it's very clear that I just want that one subject matter with the negative space around it. So I find like, because a lot of my images I find are showcasing a whole landscape or a whole scene, negative space often doesn't work. But if I was to hone in on a specific object, and do something like that and um, especially in like misty conditions negative space works really well so I guess it comes back to that idea of knowing what photographs work best in what light and weather conditions um, and obviously negative space works incredibly well when it's misty because obviously you, can, you can't see much the landscape so you've got all that negative space with the mist or again if you're doing long exposure and there's not much um, else in the landscape and you're honing in on something so Again, it depends on the conditions, but it can work really well depending on when and where you're shooting. Okay. Um, Jackie Evans has asked, do you like to go out with a photo buddy or do you prefer to go out alone? And if you go out alone, do you ever feel vulnerable in remote places? So I'm sort of half and half. I go out quite a lot on my own and I really like that because it's quite a therapeutic time for me. I find when you're out on your own, you've not got that pressure of having to, to you know, you've got all that time to, to photograph what you want and to completely immerse yourself in nature. I find when I'm out with somebody else, I'm always thinking about, you know, them and taking up too much time with my photography. And then that can often affect my, affect my images. But I do like to go away on like photography trips or holidays with my partner or friends. And there's some friends that I wouldn't go out with my camera with them because I know they wouldn't tolerate it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one or two friends who are more than happy for me to go off, you know, to come out with me and they'll sort of potter around while I'm doing photography. So it's kind of half and half for me. I do like the solitude of doing it for myself, but sometimes I like that company. In terms of feeling vulnerable, 
um, I don't really, I, I sometimes have felt vulnerable if I'm shooting around a town like early in the morning or late in the evening and there's nobody around apart from the odd maybe person walking their dog. Um, I don't like that. But if I'm somewhere actually quite remote or on a beach, I don't often feel vulnerable because especially on a beach, you can generally see if there's people coming. And although I tend to immerse myself in nature, I'm also very aware of what's going on around me. So yeah, I find I'm if I'm going to a town or a village or somewhere that's populated, I actually feel more at risk than if I'm out somewhere remote, even though like it depends how you look at it but um yeah I just I, I love that solitude of it and I I think generally speaking um you know Scotland and the UK is quite a especially the remote parts are quite safe places and obviously things do happen from time to time but if you're sensible about it and keep your wits about you then you know yeah I, I just I enjoy that solitude so yeah uh Marlis has asked uh what do you feel about square format for landscape photography yeah, it's, um, I've never shot actually square format in camera, but when I've been editing, there have been a few times when I've cropped my images to square. Um, it's not something I do very often, but um, it is, it does work in, in some situations. So again, it's depending, it's about finding your style. You know, I have watched a few other photographers who do things like YouTube and they shoot in square format a lot. And but often they're not really shooting whole landscapes or sort of honing in on like the, the more intimate details of the landscape, like a lone tree or, you know, autumn leaves and that square format works really, really well. Um, so I guess it's about finding your style and there's a lot of square format images out there that are stunning. It's something, like I said, I don't do very often, but if I'm not liking how I've shot my image, sometimes I will crop it to that square to see if it, if it adds to, to the, the the feel of it if I feel it necessary so yeah so it's something I've got a bit of a thing about is aspect ratio actually and it's because a lot of cameras now you can set the aspect ratio of the JPEG at the shooting stage but you can still crop the raw later yeah. so if you set a square image you get a square JPEG but you've still got the full information from the raw file so if you make a mistake you can change it sure. but I really think by changing aspect ratio in camera it helps you with your composition because you know you think if you look at the scene and think oh this would work well in square you might take a step to the right or or just move around a little bit to you know to to recompose to get slightly better configuration whereas if you always see in the the uh three two format maybe you won't get quite such a good square format mm -hmm. image do, but do you always shoot three two and do, do you ever sort of think right this will be a great 16 9 or a great square image <laughs> that I, I used to think about but I think because I've been watching other photographers do it especially in the last sort of year it seems becoming more popular but I think it was a lot of the more newer cameras as you say I've got these settings on them my older DSLR didn't allow me to do that but the new mirrorless camera that I've got has got that setting and I haven't yet gone out yet and messed mm -hmm. around with changing the aspect ratio but I definitely think it's something that I want to sort of experiment with moving forwards just to see if it does sort of give me a different picture or a different scene that I otherwise might not see or be able to compose in, in other mm. ratios so yeah. I think that the square format is really and then connecting your camera with Snapbridge to your phone is really useful if you're you know keen Instagram and you want to get your shots out quickly. Yeah. That's good fun. Um, so Lindsay, is, uh, you've actually almost answered this really. It should, have you shot landscapes with the new mir Nikon mirrorless cameras? Yeah, so I've got the Nikon um, Z6. I, I only got it about a month before we went into lockdown. So I've only been out with it four times. So I've not given it a proper, you know, proper good um, sort of going over and seeing all of its settings. But yeah, I've, I've shot with it about four times so far and I, I really, really like it. Um, low light conditions especially it shows up so much more and is much sharper in low light than the DSLR that I've had for the last sort of seven years so mm -hmm. um, yeah I have tried it out I'm still obviously I need to get out with that a lot more once lockdown's over um, but yeah my first impressions are I really really like it so we'll see what it takes me. Great um, I was going to ask you a question do you use some um, filters very much for your landscape photography and uh, graduated NDs or NDs? Yeah, I, I use a polarising filter a lot because I shoot a lot of water. I really like using my polarizer and it's you know one of the only filters that you can't recreate the effect in post-processing. So I use polarizers a lot. I go through phases of using 
can stop ND filters for long exposures. I tend to find I, I really enjoy long exposures for a period of time and then I don't. So I, can, but I do use that quite a lot. And ND filters, I, I do use them quite a bit, especially, you know, if the sky is really bright and the foreground's dark. I'm not, because I, I like to spend as little time editing my photos as possible, I don't tend to do like bracketing exposures and stuff and then blending them all together. So I much prefer to use a filter in the field and get it as, you know, even as possible so that there's less time editing when I get home. So yeah, I do use filters quite a lot depending on the conditions. And it is really nice to be able to see what you're getting as well, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Karen, uh, she hasn't really asked the question, but um, it's more of a, a comment on your photography and what you said. Um, basically, she agrees with your view of the importance of mindfulness um, in, as a landscape photographer, taking the shot of, from the scene in the light and the weather that you have at the time, rather than spending hours editing the image afterwards. Um, and that's very much how she feels about photography. Mm. Uh, she finds your images very natural and very appealing. So that's nice. I mean, I, I, I certainly agree with that. But I, I noticed that you didn't, I don't think, unless I missed it, I don't think you actually said the word mindfulness, but everything you said about your approach to photography sounded like a mindful approach. Yeah, I, I mentioned it very briefly in the introduction, right. but um, yeah, I mean, for me, like I got into photography because I want, like I said, I wanted to connect with nature and I always find no matter what I'm going through with in life, if I'm out with my camera photographing landscapes, I can just completely forget about it and immerse myself in nature. Like I always feel 10 times better if I'm out with my camera in nature, being present. Cause you know, mindfulness is all about being present in the moment and landscape photography or in fact any like sort of nature photography allows you to be present in the moment and really hone in on what's going on and see a world, just a world that's, I don't know, just so beautiful and really allows you to, to be present in, in the current situation. <laughs> Great. I, I agree. I, I think that's uh, entirely true. And it is, it's really good for the soul, isn't it? Mm. When you get out and you, you relax and come back and you can look at your pictures and like you say, remember that feeling or that emotion. Mm. hundred percent. Yeah. And the majority of my photographs are done at the coast. I've got a very strong connection with, you know, the coast and doing seascapes and, I just always feel so alive and so much happier when I've come back from the elements and, you know, I've been out with my camera, you know, embracing it. It, it does, it makes mm. you feel just so, so warm inside. And yeah, I love it. <laughs> Do you have places that you find yourself repeatedly going back to just because there's something about there that maybe the light's always changing or you just feel really good while you're there? I mean, I... I tend to stick to a lot of local places. Um, I'm quite, I tend to go back to the part of Scotland that I grew up in a lot. It's only about an hour and a half to two hours drive from where I currently live, just because that coastline is where my photography journey began. And although it's not the most iconic part of Scotland for photography, it means so much to me. And there's so many beaches and coves and caves there, which really resonates with, I guess, my passions. But, you know, once a year, I love to go to the west coast of Scotland to somewhere like the Isle of Skye because it mm -hmm. is incredible. But I also find that I don't want to keep longing for that and those places. So I like to find places close to home so that if I've just got an hour or two spare, I can go and enjoy them than having to find a long weekend to go and travel. So yeah, obviously there's so many incredible places in Scotland for photography, lochs, mountains, all that kind of stuff. And I like to see them, but finding those places closer to home that I can really connect to really sort of helps me um, in many ways. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Kim. It's been wonderful um, to hear from you and to see some of your images. They're really inspiring. And I think everybody's probably looking forward to being able to get out and go and have a look at Scotland again. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. Not now. <laughs> no, not now. Still in complete lockdown here in Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks very much. And hopefully we'll speak again soon. Yeah, that would be lovely. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.